Right, so hi everybody. Uh, I'm Jacob Klein. I'm the uh, current chair of the SOAS Food Study Center, and welcome to this special session of the SOAS Food Forum. So I'm sitting in the restaurant, the A Wong restaurant in London near Victoria Station, together with Andrew Wong, the chef and proprietor of the restaurant, and Mukta Das, Dr. Mukta Das, uh, social anthropologist and food studies scholar. We have a, a rather unusual arrangement today for today's uh, food forum. What we've done is that we've collected questions for Andrew and, Andrew and Mukta from our master's students on the MA Anthropology of Food program at SOAS, and also from students on Chinese anthropology uh, courses uh, in, in the Department of Anthropology at SOAS as well. Um, and uh, so these questions, students were invited to ask questions on the theme of cooking Chinese. Um, so before we get to the specific student questions, um, I thought maybe I'd ask uh, Mukta and Andrew to uh, introduce themselves a little bit and tell us about how you came to work together. Do you want to go first, Andrew? You can go, you can, because no, I always embellish the truth. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so uh, it's it's been a, it's been a while actually. Um, I started on the MA Anthropology and Food back in 2012, which was a game changer for me, a life changing moment, and I'm so glad I did because it set me on a, a really um, positive path. Um, and at that point, I wasn't entirely sure what I was going to do with it, but I quickly came to. Um, to the decision I was going to actually start to do a, a doctoral studies basically to, to start a PhD with the same food study centre and so around about 2014 um, I changed my Twitter profile um, to acknowledge the fact that I'd got onto the PhD programme and I think I'd named myself an anthropologist of food uh, and started tweeting some stuff from my literature review, uh, the history, the basic history of Chinese food, etc. And I think that caught the attention of Andrew here, uh, both my, my handle, Anthropologist of Food, as well as the bits and pieces I was tweeting out. And I think he kind of direct messaged me and we started a conversation. And I think from that moment, 2014 onwards, we've been conversing, I think, pretty regularly on, on these kinds of topics. I think that, that's my recollection anyway. I, I think that's pretty much true. I'm not sure if I instigated it or, or Mukta instigated it. But I do remember that, it, it, you know, with, with everything that we've done over the past few years, I think it is centred around the fact that um, we understand each other and we get, we get along. And I think that dynamic actually is really what keeps this relationship working in a very kind of positive kind of fluid way in the sense that you know Mukta understands that um, I'm not an academic um, I've been to university briefly um, but you know I'm a chef by trade um, and I don't I don't think like an academic and I don't um, I'm not punctual like an academic um, and and so she understands that and at the same time I also understand that you know um, Mukta is not a chef and so it's very much about understanding each other's uh, particular field and understanding how the other person perceives certain literature, certain turns of phrase, um, and certain interpretations of events through time. Interesting. So there was a lot of interest from our students uh, in terms of about both of you and your experiences growing up in and around London and how this has shaped your attitudes and understandings and approaches to food and food studies. Um, and one question that came up from a couple of students was actually, what was your experience of growing up eating food uh, in, in, in British schools and how did that change over time perhaps? Well, you, you, I can take this one for only because I'm a chef. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I tell you what, this, this entire question is particularly um, significant, I think, in, in these kind of times, in times where people are um, constantly um, conversing about cultural appropriation and the kind of diachronic nature of food through time. Um, and actually, I think that, you know, when people look at the food that we cook in a restaurant, I always say that, you know, I am not an expert in Chinese food. I am an expert in A Wong's Chinese food. And I think that's what sets us apart. So what is A Wong's Chinese food? A Wong's Chinese food is my interpretation 
of Chinese food through its 14 international borders, through its 3,000 years, um, but also through my own lens. And what is my lens? My lens is one which um, um, an individual who, who, who had a father f from Sichuan, a mother from Hong Kong, um, my grandmother cooked Sichuanese at food at home, um, and at the same time we were navigating um, Britishness in the 80s. So, you know, what does that mean? I mean, school dinners means that it, a lot of it was kind of um, thinly sliced overcooked meat, I remember, <laughs> and lots of gravy. And I remember for, for dessert wise, and this is, this is proven one of the things that we worked mm -hmm. on actually, mm -hmm. this whole idea of, of British affinity to custard. Mm -hmm. You know, that is very culturally specific. Um, you know, when you look at, when you talk to any Brit about custard, they automatically think about school dinners. But that isn't something that transfers through um, internationally. So when we when we made custard band lao sa bao, um, you know traditionally it's meant to be quite salty and so quite grainy, um, and that's the way it's meant to be. Um, but actually, we I, I made the decision to play on this kind of British affinity with custard, and kind of modify the dish, and that dish I never thought in a million years, but actually has ended up becoming one of the most popular dishes on the menu, and I think. It's because it taps into that Britishness and that at the same time, it's very much still a dim sum. And so people still see it as kind of this, this dish that travels across this, this cultural bridge of, of Hong Kong and, and, and Britain um, in a kind of like fluid way. That's great. I hope, hope, hopefully we'll be able to get back to some of those questions around uh, cultural appropriation and those kinds of mixes that you're talking about later on in the in the discussion. Thank you. Uh, Mukta. Well, that's a, that's a brilliant question um, because I guess what the question I was trying to get at, and I think it's a brilliant question, is that, you know, there's something about ca school canteen food that goes to the heart of someone's identity, I think. It's kind of a formative experience, isn't it? And I think, um, and I think I, I agree with that. It was a formative experience for me to have British food in that context when I grew up, like Andrew did, in a household where we were cooking other kinds of food, South Asian food, uh, vegetarian food largely. And actually the first moments of me eating pork <laughs> was in a British school canteen uh, in, uh, and also custard and things like this. And so it kind of, it, it kind of uh, agitates feelings of belonging when we, when I think, we, when we talk about some of our uh, <laughs> canteen experiences, it does kind of make you feel more British um, in those moments. And I think that that's quite interesting. And, and Andrew's recollection of custard, we've talked about this a lot, um, but also just, just the idea that actually there's a kind of 80s um, uh, um, a kind of 80s repertory of foods that I think are a kind of touchstone for both of us as we try and figure out what the British part of A Wong's menu is. Mm -hmm. I think that has kind of kind of keeps us grounded, keeps us keeps us you know kind of uh, kind of keeping it funny, keeping it kind of light. Uh, there is a kind of, I think, a kind of ironic play on words, on uh, play on the kind of foods that we experienced growing up in, in sort of, you know, at, outdoor dining, in, in which case this, this is kind of school. School dinners is one of those things. Um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I think this Britishness of it, I think we kind of play on a little bit, don't we? And we kind of figure out where it fits in, in the work that we do. It's, yeah. I think it's also important just to say that, uh, canteen food aside, we're talking about a time in the 80s where actually British food was kind of the laughing stock of um, Europe anyway. You know, Fren the French were laughing at Britain at this time. You know, the Italians, Mediterranean, were just kind of, what is British food? It's, it's disgusting, it's a joke. And actually, you know, this, this idea of kind of modern British cuisine, and now it's quite a revered cuisine, and everyone's, you know, mm -hmm. celebrating British produce, and, you know, there's multiple Michelin star British restaurants now. That is something that's very much kind of 90s onwards. You're talking about the era of kind of Marco Pierre White, Gordon Ramsay, and everything that kind of came off that. We're talking about 80s, which is before that, you know, where, where everything was, you know, French used to call roast beef, and everything overcooked with incredible amounts of gravy all over it. Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. I mean, I've, I've noticed part of that transformation since uh, moving to Britain uh, in, the, in the late 1990s as well. I mean, it's, it's been absolutely astonishing. I find it really interesting the way that both of you are also situating uh, 
A Wong and the work you do here within that context. And again, that's something um, you know I think we can get back to later on in the discussion as well. It's really fascinating. Um, building on this question of kind of personal experiences of of of, of uh, growing up in this country, in particular, also. Um, more specific experiences, maybe about for Andrew growing up in the in the, in the um, restaurant milieu. Um, there were students who were very interested in, in a kind of in the question of how how chefs learn to become chefs, uh, and uh, and it, I was wondering if in particular if you could give us say a little bit about the relationship between what it means to learn on the job in a restaurant and also growing up in the in a restaurant environment versus what it means to learn to cook. Uh, professionally in an institutional uh, setting. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Wow, it's a detailed question. Um, I, I think the, the, the major distinction that people need to make is that cooking as an act is something you can, you know, it's very easy to be taught actually you know, through repetition and mm -hmm. uh, muscle memory. But then there's learning your own palate. And I think that is what takes time and that's things that is a lot more difficult to, to teach. Um, he says, I grew up in a restaurant environment. I grew up in an environment where my grandmother was cooking Citronese food. Um, but at the restaurant, you know, a lot of our chefs in the 80s, they were from Guangdong. Mm -hmm. um, so they cooked very classical um, kind of southern Chinese food. Um, and so that is really what kind of determined my palate mm -hmm. um, in a sense. Um, and so, so when I became a chef, and I need to say that I never really wanted to be a chef, I kind of fell into it. And then over the years, I kind of learned to realize how much I love it unintentionally. Um, but, but, but the palate side of things is something which um, takes years and years to develop, um, to, to trust your own palate, and very simply to understand what you like and what you don't like. I think people in general, are very quick to follow suit. So if 50 people say that, you know, blue mashed potato is the best in the world, then actually if you're the 51st person, you'll probably go, you know what, I, I agree that blue mashed potato is the most delicious in the world. And the idea from a chef, I think one of the hardest things to do is to make a very clear understanding of what you perceive to be delicious and what you perceive not to be delicious. And that has to be the starting point. That is something which takes a long time to, to learn. You know, the other stuff, okay, you know, you can work in other kitchens. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a restaurant, so I was constantly surrounded in an environment where there were people doing certain techniques all the time. So, I, you know, I kind of picked them up unintentionally as well. Um, but that really is the easy side of things. The hardest side is understanding um, your own perception of flavor. So you also have a, an academic background, both in uh, chemistry and in anthropology. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that and how that's uh, shaped your, your cooking practices and understanding of food. People off, often ask this, and um, I gotta say, like, you know, education for, for me personally was, was not really a, necessarily about subject matter. It was about, um, about fulfilling goals more than anything. You know, I went to university to, to fulfill the goal of, of getting a degree to make sure that my parents dis wouldn't disown me at, at 21. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, when I look back now and the fact that, um, you know, Mukta and I have, have done so much work together over the years, I do remember, actually, I, I don't remember 99% of, of my anthropology degree at LSE, but I do remember the one module, which is the anthropology of food. Um, and whether or not that was because, you know, subconsciously I'd grown up in, you know, around the environment, so it meant something a little bit more to me. But I do remember, the, you know, understanding the fact that, you know, this food isn't just food. Um, it really is as much cultural as it is kind of uh, biological. Mm -hmm. And it is there to be reimagined from generation to generation. And that's really what I took out of um, that particular course. Um, and, and that's something that I, I question again all the time uh, on a daily basis, because what are we doing in this restaurant? You know, we are not um, taking old recipes from old books, um, whether it be Madame Wu's recipes or, or from um, whoever's and, and, and trying to recreate them. What we're trying to do is find an expression of celebrating um, moments in time 
um, and that does that isn't necessarily going to be factually 100 percent but that doesn't matter it's the fact that eating is so much more than just about being pedantic about moments in time it's more about an expression um, and because I understood that from an anthropological point of view I think it's made my life so much easier um, when we work together. I think that uh, what you're saying there segues very nicely into a series of questions that we had, we've had from our students, um, particularly concerned with the uh, creation and development of menus uh, and the way in which the two of you have collaborated on that. Um, and one question that we had was particularly concerned with uh, Mukta's research into the histories and cultures of Chinese cuisines, and in what ways this has shaped and helped uh, Andrew's uh, uh, menu development and, and, and cooking, um, and whether you have any also concrete examples of that. Uh, and maybe Mukta, do you want to begin um, answering that question? Sure, thank you. Um, that's a great question, and it's not a really easy one to answer. Andrew touched upon it a little bit, and, and Jacob's question to Andrew just now kind of, I think, um, grounds this a little bit, because when I work with Andrew, we have an inherent kind of very implicit understanding that what we're doing is finding this sort of intersection. And this is, I'm drawing on your work, Jacob, when you taught me 20 years ago, <laughs> this intersection between sort of continuity and change and structure and agency, right? The, this intersection of where the human lies. So I like to think of myself when I work with Andrew as bringing the anthropology bit into history, right? And so when we look at um, old texts and we look at sort of Chinese history in broad terms, you know, you, you, I have to know that stuff really, really clearly, right? I, I have to look at the Spencers of the world and, and work out all the sort of structural, all the big stories. And then I look at the kind of social institutions, the kind of Rowsky, the Ellen, uh, Evelyn Rowskys, you know, the kind of social institutions that really kind of interesting kind of human dynamics of these histories too. So I've got the big structure, I've got the human dynamics of those social institutions. And then I work with uh, food um, histories, food, food studies, the, uh, uh, the Casey Changs, the HT Huangs, uh, and then I kind of bring in a little bit more anthropological um, kind of you know, the kind of the stuff that, you know, kind of sits within that intersection, you know, how do humans shape um, the time that they're in? And how does that time shape them, that kind of co constitutive element, right? So that's the kind of work I do in preparation for any kind of conversation with Andrew, because I want to give him that level of agency when he kind of starts to construct his work. Um, and because of his background, because he understands anthropology in that inherent sense, because he kind of also understands the chemical uh, chemicals around food, he kind of gets that a lot of the work that we do are, is kind of constructing a kind of techno-cultural um, part of you, this kind of history, right? We, we know that it's not all there. We know that the recipes kind of speak to some things, but actually lots of things about those recipes are about human decisions around the technical aspects, around the technologies that they had, around the ingredients that they had, and the kinds of ideas around taste and what tastes good. And so it's about giving Andrew as um, an idea of that structure, as well as an idea of the human agency around that. And it takes a lot of reading <laughs> to get to that point, to have informal conversations with him. Um, but that's the kind of work I do in preparation for some of those some of the questions that kind of arrive at my in my WhatsApp at 2 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Great. Uh, Andrew, do you want to say, speak to that as well? Yeah, I think, I think Mukta is absolutely right. She, she puts in a lot of work and sometimes she really kind of breaks it down into the bare minimum before she sends it to me. I think, and a lot of it's conversation to try to um, succinctly explain a lot of the reading that's gone on before she brings these very succinct excerpts and um, because she also realizes that I'm a chef and I don't have um, 20 hours a week to, to, to read through reams and reams and reams and reams of, of, of text um, but what she's also realized is that um, she, she looked to highlights like the odd sentence here or there or the odd paragraph which she thinks um, I would be interested in and nine out of ten times they really are the bits that I automatically like scan to 
And then, so as I flick through the, the, the text that she's been sending me, you, I'll begin to build a picture. Um, and it won't necessarily be a picture of just that reading, but it'll be a picture made up of other bits of text that she sent me over the over the years. Um, whether or not she's talking about, I don't know, talking about the fact that Imperial banquets, you know, there's this constant sideboard of, of dried fruit and nuts sitting there. Or there's a fact that she's talking about, um, I don't know, the, the idea of, of dairy products in certain dishes. And so as I read certain texts that she's given me, at the same time, I'm trying to bring in all other texts which, which I remember and I, would, I was particularly um, fond of during my uh, times that she sent me texts. And I try and build like um, a proposal together mm. of a dish. And a lot of the time I'll send back this, send this back to Mukta and she will then go, okay, well, first of all, let's try and put it into a framework that makes sense, like any type of sense. And um, because my, my decisions are purely based on flavor a lot of the mm. time, right? So it'll be all this text and I put it into a form, which, okay, for the most recent example would be, Sour cherry, um, preserved plum, um, some form of animal fat. Um, what else did I say? Some dairy. Some dairy. Um, and I'm trying to construct that into something. Mm -hmm. And so Mukta will then take that information and she will go, okay, well, how about you look at it from this perspective? Have a look at this set of recipes, uh, which would be related to preserve plum, for example, mm -hmm. or, or it might be like, I don't know, blossom trees or whatever it might be, maybe connected or not so in interconnected. And then I will take that information and I'll try and build on top of it. And then as you build and you build and you build, you know, sometimes it, mo it won't end up being a, a, a cherry dish at all. It will end up being a fish dish, mm -hmm. but it's that process of just building and building and building until you reach a common ground where, um, we think that it tells a story, number one, mm. and number two, it's a plate of delicious food. Mm. Do, you, do you have any of, maybe give us a couple of uh, concrete examples that illustrate that, that collaborative process? Sure, I mean, um, we, we've had loads along the way, and some of them are, are, are tiny garnishes, so they're parts of dishes. Um, I, I remember a dish that we worked on a while back, which I took off the menu recently, um, was this idea of, trying to find um, a chocolate dish relevant to, to China. Um, and, and so Mukta did quite a lot of work to try and find some form of, of <laughs> so so, some form of link between China and chocolate. Um, and then we kind of looked into coffee um, and then we looked into bananas. And so she looked into kind of banana plantations in Yunnan. Mm. And then with that, we started to move into kind of um, black truffles. Mm. Um, and so the, the end of it, I remember, was um, a cherry on the cake for me, was her sending me some text about um, people running away and hiding in banana plantations during the Mongol... Um, no, no. Was not during a, the hand. Was it yeah, during the hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the, the end, the end <laughs> um, I don't know how this dessert came about, but what ended up being, it ended up being like this, this, this chocolate um, molten cake um, with kind of um, really stretchy Middle Eastern um, pistachio ice cream with uh, dusted cocoa, dusted fermented black bean, and then these massive shards of kind of um, different textures that lay on top of it made from rice paper. Um, yeah, I, think, I thought it was delicious anyway. <laughs> it, was I delicious. Th it was a delicious plate of food. And as I said, it, does it, does it, is it an exact replica of anything that we read before? No, absolutely not. Is it an exact... Um, historical study of a specific moment in time? No, absolutely not either. But what it is, is it's a delicious plate of food that is very much rooted in our work about China. Yeah, so, so basically, I, I think what I help Andrew do is have a, some sort of bandwidth yeah. between this point and this point. What are the possibilities? And as you know, you know, um, especially you know parts of subtropical China, you, you, you have an endless variety yeah. of, of raw materials. And so what can you do with that raw material? What kind of time period can shape those decisions? Um, and what's happening around socially in those time periods that might produce a kind of 
creative force mm. within Andrew that kind of emerges that kind of dish. And so that's what I tend to do is kind of give him a, a, a bandwidth, a structure, a, a way of thinking, a, a choice of times and, um, and dynamics mm. that then he um, builds on mm. and we, we have this bit of, bit of feedback. And yeah, I mean, I know that the chocolate thing is a bit of a bug there for me, <laughs> but <laughs> ultimately, ultimately, you know, he is creating food and, and there is, um, I, I don't go in and say, no, that's off the menu completely. Um, you know, he is, he's running a commercial business. Um, it needs to meet the um, requirements of that and, and entertain diners and, and taste good. And so I, I just give it a shape and, and then, you know, layer it. Um, accordingly, so yeah. It's I, I remember another example actually was where you were telling me um, we were talking about wine in general. Mm. I remember, mm. and um, Mukta started to talk about the kind of the development of grape-based wine as mm. opposed to rice grape wine coming through um, Persia on mm. the, on one of the Silk Road uh, Silk Road routes, mm. and that was great. So I thought, okay, well. That that's good because I don't have to use purely kind of fadil jiao or or rice wine for for this dish. I can use something a little bit more kind of floral, mm. um, and also allows me to use grapes, which in Chinese cooking you don't see it that much in grapes really, and um, which is good because it, it it gives me a level of acidity and sweetness to add to dishes, uh, together with this idea of using wine, um, and then I remember you telling me that. Um, with these kind of version, uh, these Persian excursions into China, there would have been these mass banquets of, of celebrations where there would have been grape. Uh, yeah, oasis towns. Yeah, grape, yeah, grape, been some. based wine, basically grape piss ups, basically. <laughs> um, and and again, we, we again, I, I had this idea of you know, a banquet, these kind of big um, celebratory bits of meat that you normally would accustom to being part of a, a celebration and it ended up being a, a, like a, a rib that we have on a dish um, which is a, a, a very very expensive piece of pork rib and um, which we then use kind of like various different garnishes from dehydrated pork skin we use pickled grapes on top of it and we use a little bit of um, particularly red wine in the sauce as opposed to rice based wine but purely for that reason now can you actually taste it um, I think you'd, you'd have to have a really, really, really kind of um, nuanced palate to, to taste the difference after that, with that particular, because there's so much sugar in it, there's so much star anise in it, there's so much other kind of dried spice in that dish. But for me anyway, the fact that I know it and the fact that I know that we, we had multiple conversations about this thing, to me it makes the dish so much more interesting. Um, and to me it gives me a real, as I said, a bandwidth um, to which I understand that dish and it's mm. it's rooted very much in my understanding and my learnings of China. I think that's that's brilliant. It really speaks so interestingly to the kinds of relationship between continuity and change, mm. between the structure of cuisine and kind of individual and collaborative invention uh, as well. So uh, absolutely uh, wonderful stuff. Um, our students were also very interested. Maybe so if. In, in, in menus as well. So if you move a little bit from uh, flavor combinations and individual dishes to the, uh, the concept of a menu more broadly, what kinds of things uh, do you think about when you develop your, your overall menus? What kind of uh, messages or, or, or meanings do you want to convey uh, through the construction of those menus? Do you want to go first? Oh, it's up to you. Um, well, we... Um this is quite prescient because actually um, Andrew's um, work at the restaurant now is um, kind of an, the early stages of introducing um, um, a banqueting menu in the evenings mm. and this is kind of a, a menu where people can come and um, Andrew will send them dishes uh, I think 18 or 20 dishes yep. all together mm. um, and they won't necessarily they'll know what's coming but they won't necessarily you know they can obviously choose vegetarian etc but they are basically fed as you would expect in, uh, in an elite or an imperial household, for example. So, um, so you know, we had some early conversations about that back in November or December last year. He introduced this for Chinese New Year this year, so February. Um, and so back in November, he was asking me about what he should think about in terms of constructing this menu. Like, what, what are the kind of, like, big ideas? 
And one of the things that we came up with was this idea of fives, a very important number in, in, um, in, in, in sort of Chinese history, uh, you know, Chinese sort of philosophy as well, um, and Chinese food, as well as the, uh, and, and he asked me for some examples of banqueting menus. And so when we looked together at a particular banqueting menus from the Qing dynasty, the, the final dynasty in China, um, we, we came across, you know, this idea of fives. There were sort of uh, banquets that were split into five movements or, or five sections. Um, and then, um, you know, several dishes in between that kind of uh, were a, they kind of played on this issue of fives in terms of bringing in um, different kinds of textures and flavors uh, and, and moving these things in, in seasons. And so that kind of gave Andrew a, a, an idea of how to structure this menu. And so um, Andrew chose to structure the menu in sort of providing um, five sections or five movements within, this, within his banqueting menu itself and to start to mix together different textures and flavors accordingly. So giving contrast um, to, the, to the dishes in each of these five uh, movements as well. So those are the kind of big ideas we started with at the beginning. And then um, it, um, Andrew makes these decisions within that structure to then place particular dishes within it, you know, and the timing of them and how they sort of uh, sit together. I'll, I'll pass on to Andrew to talk about the other, other decisions. Yeah, yeah, I mean, she, the Mukta is absolutely right in the, in the sense that um, this conversation started. It started out way back before, like November, okay. actually, because it's been it's been something we I've, I've been thinking about for a long time, and I always probe her with little questions, like in the middle of the night, I go, oh, how about this or how about that? Because actually, an a la carte menu is actually, to me, um, not the correct way to eat um, a lot of um, Chinese food. Um, and I think that, um, I think it's, it, again, I haven't, I'm sure Mukta's actually answered this question before, but I might have forgotten the answer, of this, uh, this idea of this construct of an a la carte menu. I'm not even entirely sure if it was even rooted in, in, in China at all, or whether it was maybe a Western construct um, of going into a restaurant and, and looking through things and, and picking them one by one. Um, and actually from an eating perspective, I think Chinese food in general um, doesn't lend itself to um, having dishes singularly. I think, um, and, and Western chefs are, are the most guilty of this, mm -hmm. is that when they think of dishes of food, they always talk about balance of flavor. Mm -hmm. So they talk about balance of flavor and balance of texture, mm -hmm. but they always reference it in terms of individual plates of food. Mm -hmm. And I just think as a cuisine, um, Chinese food is so different that you cannot imprint that, those parameters onto it. Mm -hmm. I always feel that the very best way to eat um, our food in particular mm -hmm. is about having multiple dishes. Mm -hmm. um, having a spicy dish, um, a sweeter dish, a dish that has more texture, a dish that has less texture, a little broth. Mm -hmm. um, and it comes with this idea of five, you know, the five, you can relate it back to the five elements, mm -hmm. but then you can also relate it back to the five flavors, you know, the sweet, sour, bitter, pungent, mm -hmm. salty. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, as, as Mukta explains more about um, background mm -hmm. around these banquets, I latch on to things like these five flavors, the five elements, mm -hmm. I start reading things about Confucius that I never knew from before. Um, uh, and, and, and as we build this picture, um, at the same time, we slowly evolve this idea of what would it feel like um, to be part of one of these occasions? And it's never gonna be a banquet which is, which is a replica of going to one of these Qing banquets, you know, one of these you know, banquets of everyone over the age of 70, was it? Um, oh, the Feast of the Elders. The fe yeah. Feast of the Elders. Um, but I don't think it's about that. I think my job as a chef um, is about giving people the, the experience and the emotional attachment of what would it have felt like to go somewhere, um, feel really special, get dressed up, and get delivered um, an experience where, you know, when it arrives, you go, wow, there's like, you know, five or six different dishes all at the same time, mm. you know, for you to pick at, 
you know, the conversation will ultimately um, revolve around how one dish works with another dish, how one contrasts another. And it's about creating that experience more so than going, well, the, the archives show that you know, there was a double braised turtle dish together with a bear dish and, and you know, seven cold um, you know, fish carpaccios on the menu. I think that, I think if we did that, I think that we wouldn't be able to express our work um, as well as the way that we do it, which gives us a little bit more creative freedom. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, building on that, it's, it's been interesting for us to kind of drill down onto a specific menu in the Qing Dynasty and to ask questions about it. Um, and to almost, if you like, using uh, Andrew's kind of work in the kitchen and his menu to kind of speak back to the academy in terms of, okay, if this is a printed menu um, and it represents work of a, of a particular kitchen and, a, and the work of a particular diner, you know, um, what, what does it actually mean? How does it, how does it work in concrete terms? And so we've, we've had lots of discussions and we've had to tweak things as we go along and Andrew especially has had to tweak things as he goes along to make these things work in a modern day kitchen, mm -hmm. but also to kind of question again, well, okay, if we are talking about um, kind of strict rules around um, principles around balance mm -hmm. and taste and, and five flavors and the five um, sapples and the five etc then actually a lot of this is invented mm -hmm. you know kind of invented or creatively interpreted mm -hmm. it, it, on paper mm -hmm. the recipes themselves are literature almost rather than a scientific writing down of what actually mm -hmm. happened um, and so we you know we kind of we kind of allow ourselves a little bit more freedom than the printed um, menus it mm. would, would usually give us because we I think we, we kind of interpret them as literature and so mm. we can then draw creative inspiration from it without having to uh, marry ourselves to the actual mm. printed words if you yeah. see what I mean I, I think what is even more interesting is the fact that actually it, it works better like that because number one a lot of the texts that we work off are, are translations mm. and number two the people doing these translations they're not chefs a lot of the time so actually a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll get them side by side and there were certain terms which are very chefy terms that people will use, but the translation doesn't work because it, it, it's, as a, as a saying, it's pretty meaningless. It might just be blanche, mm. but as a chefy term, um, it's not just blanche. Mm. It's blanche in a particular way, mm. or it's double steam in a particular way. And I think, you know, every, you know all the students are academic, so I think that's a, it's an important thing to say um, that, you know, because of that, there will be nuances that are sometimes lost. And I think that's where I can help um, Mukta sometimes in the sense that we might read a passage and it might be like, well, this, 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 and this in 10 steps. And I'll turn around and I'll just go, you know what, actually the chances of it being constructed like this are probably quite low mm -hmm. because you wouldn't be able to make the dish like this. You'd be actually number five actually probably needs to come before number two. Um, in order for this dish to, to actually be functional and be, be, be a reality. Um, either because, you know, one part of the, the recipe which talks about marination, it makes no sense to do that later on. Or, you know, they're talking about some steaming process which takes place before a double boiling process. I'm going, I don't, I wouldn't see this happening in real life. You know, if they were doing it for a banquet, they might be trying to reheat the food. So I get why there is a double cooking process, but I would probably not put in that. And I think that is quite an interesting conversation mm. for my, and it's the only time really where I feel like I can um, contribute back mm. to, to Mukta's work as, a bit, as opposed to it being more kind of one directional sometimes. So, A Wong as a restaurant has uh, now been awarded two Michelin stars. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, so it is, you know, irrefutably, a fine dining restaurant, right? Nobody would, would 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 argue with that. But what does actually fine dining mean in a, a Chinese culinary context? Um, presumably, in London, given the diversity of cuisines in London, there's going to be all sorts of different ideas about what fine dining haute cuisine actually means. Um, how do you negotiate between those different understandings and meanings, given the diversity also of your customers and clientele, which you've actually already spoken about a little bit in terms of your move to the, to the, bank, uh, the banqueting style menu. Um, how do you negotiate between those things uh, in, in, in your work? Um, Andrew, do you want to begin with that one? Maybe? Sure. I think, um, I think number one, we try 
not to ever use the term fine dining because I think it's more confusing than anything. I think in, in particular 2022, I think that term in itself um, creates more problems. Um, it's very much a Western construct. Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, I've spoken with Mukta about this. I think China, Chinese cuisine is so unique in the sense that um, kind of very high-end food mm -hmm. isn't massively different to the food of the people. Um, and so, you know, how, how do you differentiate cuisine then if actually it's all available historically to everyone and, you know if i if i compare it to french cuisine where if you're talking about kind of royal cuisine it's very very particular mm. as opposed to kind of um you know everyday french mm. cuisine so there, therefore if you talk about fine dining okay well if it's, it's a celebration of of you know camus or escoffier you know then that makes sense but actually even if you look at um you know in 2020 if you look at roasting processes for example which you know those you know, we know for a fact that those took place two and a half thousand years ago from etchings and stuff that we've looked at um would they have eaten those in a palace yes you know can you go down to the you know the local chinese takeaway and get some roast duck equally as delicious absolutely still yes as well so i think you know because it's so difficult to navigate that i think this term fine dining really doesn't mean very much um the the fortunate thing for us in 2020 is that you know we, we happen to be the only two Michelin star Chinese restaurant outside of China, mm -hmm. um, which means that actually we're in a very fortunate position in the sense that we get to make the rules. <laughs> um, you know, and I, I would like to think that actually um, what, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make food um, delicious, but also thought prov provoking. Um, and and we, we do it in a way which I hope is respectful to um, my culture. Um, and what is that? That's about kind of a level of humbleness, a level of care, a level of hospitality, which I think, you know, whether or not it's true or not is, is debatable. What, what I perceive to be um, Chinese-ness in me, which has made me um, draw particular importance to certain aspects of hospitality. Um, and you know, if, if that ends up being a definition of, of fine dining some, some, somewhere in the future, then, then great. But if not, if it just stays as being kind of our interpretation of the way we look after our guests, then that's also great too. Mm. Great. Mukta, do you want, do you want to add to that? Um, just to say that, um, yeah, I agree. We, what, we, what I think Andrew and I love to do is democratise this, um, this idea of where you would go for really excellent Chinese food. Because we know that... Britain, migration, all of these um, things, uh, these dynamics mean that it's difficult to, to gauge price and experience. You know, you, you, you don't, what you, the skills you get in the kitchen don't, don't map onto the price you pay at the counter or mm. the price that you pay, you know, at, at the table. It's, it's, a re it's almost disjointed, you know, the kind of premium quality stuff that you can get compared to what you're paying for, especially around Chinese, especially Chinese food in, in, in British cities. So we're aware of that. And um, what we try and do with, uh, we have a podcast every, every couple of weeks, we kind of put a podcast out. And what we try and do is we kind of look at the skills um, that uh, Chinese chefs have to bring <laughs> uh, to, their, to their cuisine and to unpack that and to share that knowledge um, to other chefs, to other people who are interested in Chinese food or food in general, so that we can sort of explore the level of skill that is required, the level of technique, the kind of understanding of chemistry that is inherent in the cooking process in some of these classic Chinese dishes that Andrew is, you know, well versed in and others as well. And to sort of, I think, break open this idea that fine dining has to be in this kind of space. Mm. Actually, you can experience these skills by um, simply walking around and, and, and finding the kind of good Chinese food that you can find in lots of different places. And so we, that's what we're trying to do, I think, is to kind of break open this idea of fine dining, things being very located in, in these kind of white tablecloth situations mm -hmm. and, and really situate it within the body, the, the, the skills of the chef um, mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. and the kind of techniques they bring to their, their daily grind. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so that's, that's the kind of work we're hoping to do. And that's what we try and do with the podcast and, and other things. I mean, it is, it's, an, it's an anthropological mm. um, 
research in itself in, in trying to understand why Chinese cuisine as a cuisine has managed to find itself in a situation where um, it doesn't fit into any economical mathematics for running a restaurant. You know, if you, if, you know, because there, there are industry norms, mm. and if you look at Chinese restaurants, they pretty much are always underselling mm. um, against that mathematics. And, and that is completely a, a cultural thing. Like, what the reasons for it, I don't know. But, um, you know, what, what we do try to do in, in a lot of our work is to try to celebrate the technique, as, as Mukta said, and try to get people to understand, you know, well, why. Why would you go to a, a three-star restaurant in, in Italy and pay 90 euros for a risotto, a, a white risotto? Um, yeah, at the same time, you know, people won't pay. Um, you know, people will com complain about paying 11 pounds for um, some one-ton soup noodle where those one-ton noodles um, have been bamboo bamboo made so someone literally had to bounce on them physically for an hour mm. you know it's a very specific recipe which has evolved over generations and generations and generations you've got a broth which is made out of multiple types of mm. dried seafood uh, with chicken stock like whole chickens again a massive expense and then you've got these wontons which are made out of you know shellfish um dried prawn uh, powder again expensive ingredients mm. yet you go to hong kong you know they wouldn't Nowadays, because of inflation, it's gone up to probably, you know, fifty, sixty dollars a bowl. But you know, what what could you be charging for that if people were mapping onto it their normal kind of acceptability of what they will pay for delicious food? You could you, you're talking about you know a selling price which would be multiple times more expensive than what it what it is being charged for. Mm -hmm. I wonder um, to what extent uh, what you're involved in then is some in some ways a a kind of um, a didactic project in some ways, a project about teaching the world about what this cuisine is, what its possibilities are, what its, uh, you know, what, 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 what kinds of, what its histories, but also futures could be. Um, it struck me very much that when you were talking earlier about uh, your, your recent introduction of a banqueting menu, that in some ways that appears to be a kind of accommodation to the fact that you're uh, actually, um, you know, you're, you're, you're selling your cuisines to a wide, a, a very diverse clientele, um, many of whom are not uh, uh, Chinese. And in some ways, I, I would think of as, as Chinese gastronomy, to be a, a, a gastronomer in a Chinese context is precisely to know how to combine different kinds of dishes on the table, right? Know what things go well together, but in some ways, what you seem to be doing is also, to some extent, maybe teaching the diner about that. This is what combinations are good. These are what kinds of things that work. These are the possibilities that we can uh, fit together. Does that is that um, correct at all, or is that kind of? Um, I'm always a little bit skeptical about this idea of me teaching, guessing, but actually, unintentionally, probably yes. Um, and again, I, you know, I don't take. Um, our privileged position lightly, you know, as, as you said, we, we are, whether or not we like it or not, we are a reference point mm. for a gastronomy mm. in an international city. Mm. Now, um, as I said, that's a, that's a very big responsibility. Mm. So, uh, you know, in, in, a, in, a, in a world where, you know, it's very easy to, to, to message things wrong or, or be, you know, unintentionally inaccurate, I, I, I think, um, it's very important that what we do is is respectful, and what we do is celebratory. Um, so, so uh, you know, the banqueting example is, is very much about that. You know, we, we we tell people from the very first time that they make the reservation that, you know, if you're expecting 999 dishes um, as part of your 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 experience, it's not going to happen. Um, if you're if, if you've done a little bit of research on the internet before you come into um, you know Qing banqueting and expecting some of those dishes to be on your menu, you're, you're also going to be disappointed. Mm -hmm. um, but we do hope that the very fact that we inspired someone to Google it, mm -hmm. I think that in itself is um, the difference that we're making. Mm -hmm. Mukta, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I, I think. Um, yeah, I think Andrew's right in that. Um, I think we we never set out to teach 
anything, mm -hmm. but I understand, I understand the term. And I think what it is, it's, is about allowing people the space to educate themselves about their palates, mm -hmm. um, what they, f you know, uh, to experience um, a balance of flavors and textures in a different way than they might be used to, um, and to um, find out a little bit more if they want to. You know, I think it, you know, we kind of allow them a learning space, if I can say that, <laughs> uh, for that to happen, mm. and and to acknowledge the fact that we're also learning too. Like we, we never really actually. You know, um, no dish is complete. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's always something more to add, something more to take away, and so uh, we're on a bit of a process ourselves. And so, um, feedback from guests, if they like it, if they don't like it, what they would prefer, um, is also really important in that process as well. So, mm -hmm. I think we're all giving ourselves some space to learn a little. So, as a as a final question uh, for this discussion. Um, which I think ties into what we've just been talking about. Uh, a lot of our students were interested uh, very much in the kind of politics of cultural appropriation, to what extent it's acceptable for non-Chinese chefs to be, uh, to, to be making Chinese cuisine and, and, and selling that in Chinese restaurants and so on. And they were very interested in, in what, you, what your uh, views of, this kinds of, of these kinds of debates um, are. I'm the best person to start this answer because I need Mukta's support um, <laughs> and to answer it. Because the, the, the simple fact is, and I don't mean to um, trivialize the question in any way, but I honestly um, am not entirely sure um, what, what cultural appropriation is. Um, I, I know what it is in terms of a definition, um, but the way that it is questioned in mass media, I find it very difficult to understand what people are referring to each time they are referring to from case to case. Mm -hmm. And every time I, I need to turn to Mukta and I go, am I just being really like culturally inept or, <laughs> or just culturally blind? Or, or am I not seeing something? And I think sometimes Mukta is the best person to ask because um, she's not Chinese. Um, but she's an expert in, in, in the field which helps our work. Mm -hmm. And so she, she perceives it from multiple different angles, which, which I can't, can't often see. Well, to be, <laughs> to be fair to Andrew, actually, he's so enmeshed in anthropology and history yeah. that he obviously questions the term itself, as we've been taught to do by Jacob and others, you know, to actually like, what does that mean? What, how do we bound, why is it important to bound a culture? When is it important to bound a culture? Um, and so, you know, we're seeing these dynamics play out here in London, in other places, in other cities, in other contexts, people attempting to bound something. But actually the work that Andrew and I do, especially when we take into account the richness of Chinese history and how much uh, Chinese food cultures have been malleable, you know, had been made by foreign influences and foreign ingredients and foreign techniques and, and have, you know, um, uh, kind of exported these out as well. You know, it's a really um, interesting task to bound Chinese culture into one thing, right? The Chinese food culture into one thing. And so Andrew's confusion is our confusion, is your confusion, is my confusion. You know, it's not necessarily, the, um, you know, what are the results of it, but why do it? <laughs> and so that's the kind of conversation we have is that why is it important for this journalist to ask you? Why is it important for this person to ask you what you feel about this? You know, it, rather than answer the question itself, it's to question the, the issue, you know, and, and why it's become important in this day and age. And I think that's, and we, you know, we, we, and I ask him, you know, are you okay with sitting in a bit of confusion? Is it okay to be confused and to not have the answer? Um, and inevitably he'll say, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. And so it's, um, it is about um, kind of looking at these dynamics as complex uh, and not necessarily something that, um, uh, you know, needs a, an immediate response and to kind of question the issue of binding something or bounding something or boundering it you know have, ha having a boundary on something um yeah uh, it's it's yeah i, I think uh, together with that point i don't although i do sit in a massive pool of confusion every time this issue arises <laughs> um i do i do always 
make this relationship between the question that we're asking and this idea of ownership and you're talking mm. about bound and whenever we talk about ownership the things that I reference from our work is number one when did chilies arrive in Sichuan um, because they're definitely not Chinese no matter how much you try to um, find a really tenuous link um, potatoes you know I, I've, I've read a few pieces where they've tried to convince that me that there are one or two strands of the potato family are indigenous to China, but I'm not entirely sure. Um, bananas, um, and, and, and when, when, when we talk about appropriation, I go, always go back to this idea of ownership. Mm. And um, if ownership is appropriation, then I think it's a very, very difficult um, road to go down. But at the same time, Mukta always tells me that you know China, as I said, is biggest sponge of other people's cultures. So what it is today and the perception of what China is today really is just a massive like collection of of multicultural influences over thousands of years. Yet it's been painted as this um this entity that hasn't moved through time. Um, and so when I when I accept that and I look at China as a sponge, then I can sit a little bit better within this pool of confusion. And I think that a lot of people's problems within this confusion is the fact that they can't see China as a sponge. They see it as this kind of, this immalleable uh, entity, which is just China. And I think that's where the real problem comes about. Mm, nice answer. I think that's a, a wonderfully thought-provoking and anthropological uh, way in which to end what's been a fascinating uh, conversation. So. Thank you so much, Mukta. Thank you so thank much, you. Andrew, for this uh, fascinating opportunity. And I'd also like to thank uh, all of our students for their uh, wonderful questions. It's really, um, it's really been been a, a privilege to um, be able to, um, yeah, talk with you today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very uh, much. Great. And I'm going to say she forgot to press record. No, don't, don't <laughs> even joke about that.